Let me give you just finally. I like that picture. I've drawn it many times and I still get a lift out of it. Not because I say it, but because it's so marvelous. That they put Jesus in the tomb. And he'd been dead three days. And the devil isn't very happy about it. He says, you know, that man pulled so many tricks, I don't just know what he's going to do. And he sends a demon down and the demon comes down and he says, yes, I, I went in the tomb. He's cold. He's as dead as that slab he's on. He's all right. And Satan says, you know, I feel a bit uncomfortable about it. We've only got, we've only got about 60 seconds left. And if he gets out of that, out of that death, we're, we're, we're licked. If we can keep him there, we can fill hell with the human race. But if he gets out, we're sunk. A demon says, well, your majesty, we've got a stone over the grave. And we've got wax over the stone and we've got seals over the wax. Oh, why, don't you, why don't you roll the sin of the world against the stone? Good idea, good idea. You know, I, I, I still feel that he might still do something. Another demon says, Your Majesty, why don't we round up every demon in hell and earth? And we've got the stone there and the wax and the seal and the soldiers and the sin of the world and we get every demon to put his shoulder against that stone. And he won't get out. Excellent, says Lucifer. Round up every demon and every demon goes. So you've got the stone and the wax and the seal and the soldiers and the sin of the world and now every demon there. And Satan says, I think we've got it now. Hold tight. We've only about ten more seconds to go. And he starts the countdown, the first, the greatest countdown ever. And Satan, say, Satan says, all right, hold it there. It's ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. He's just going to say one and the Holy Ghost beat him to it. How do you know? Because this chapter says the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. You say he's going to raise me from the dead. No, no, he's going to do it tonight if you let him do it. He's going to raise you from the death of sin and the bondage of sin and the fetters of sin. And you go out liberated. Because you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Christ, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And you have dominion, whereas you've been in bondage, you're now free, you're liberated. What a pity. That the church has forgotten about it. A young lady said to me last night, I've, I, I've been told about many times about being crucified with Christ, but I didn't realize when you, when you mentioned it tonight, you know, I kind of fear that death. But, but I said, remember that we're not saved by the death of Jesus Christ, we're saved by his resurrection. And you go to the cross not just to die, you go to find life, not death. I'm going to need about 10 million years to talk it over with Paul in heaven. So if you see me talking, keep your nose out of it for a while, will you? Let me ask him a few questions and celebrate a bit of victory with him. This blessed man sold out. He could have died, as we say, a multimillionaire, one of the greatest philosophers ever. And you know what he says? He says, I covet no man's silver or gold or apparel. You ask those boys on TV tomorrow if they do. There's nothing in the world fascinates me. I'm a captive, I'm a slave, I've got a message of emancipation, I care not whether man's black or white or what color he is, I care not how depraved he is. He runs his masked head there and says one of the most amazing things in his letter to Corinthians, he says, if any man, I like that, I like that. By one man's disobedience, sin entered into the world, and since that, billions and trillions and quadrillions of sins are being committed. And if you'd sin ten million sins, if you can, broken and contrite, there's one who one day he took our sins in his body on the tree, though it wasn't his body that did the suffering, his soul was made an offering for sin. And as the hymn writer said, none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through before he found the sheep that was lost. I don't know, and you don't know, and no man that ever lived ever knew. You see, the, the, the older I get, the more I realize great is the mystery of godliness. There, there are things we'll never explain to you by reason. If you could explain them by reason, you wouldn't need faith. There are something that puzzles me. I accept them by faith. 
I don't know how somebody in eternity, the heaven of heavens couldn't contain him, was compressed into the matrix of the Virgin Mary. I don't understand that. How she conceived a son without any human aid, but he was conceived by the Holy... I don't understand it, but there's something more baffling than that. Not that God became man, but that that man became sin. He kind of thumbs his nose to the devil. He says to the devil, listen, I want to tell you something. There's nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. You can separate me from the saints and put me in prison. You can wall me in, but you can't roof me in. There's nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Tribulation, distress, famine, peril, nakedness, sword. Neither death nor life. And then as though he looks at the devil and says, I don't care what you've got in hell, but I'll tell you one thing, it'll break down if you try it on me. That if you're a true believer and you've repented of your sin and trusted him to cleanse you, again, that in verse 9, God dwelleth in you. In verse 10, Christ is in you. And verse 11, do you wonder, he says, we're more than conquerors. How can you fail if that's true? He's able to cleanse the heart. He's able to purge the conscience. He's able to come and, and make a, a person the habitation of his spirit, the habitation where God lives in me, Christ lives in me, the spirit lives in me.